Right, this is the uh, PowerPoint from week seven for Methodology of Social Science, Applied Sociology, um, on the theme of Ersterhen. I'll record week eight, which is actually this week, um, once I've done this, but I'm recording this because there were very few people actually in class last week, a lot of you were self-isolating. So this is for the benefit of those of you who weren't in class last week, or even for those who were and who want a reminder of what we covered. Um, okay, so for today's one, we're going to have a look at Verstehen itself as a concept. A little bit more on content analysis, not too much. And I'll go over the assignment for how to lay out um, assignment number one. Assignment number two is very similar in layout, but this is focused on number one primarily. And then explain to you what you need to be cracking on with in terms of your data analysis for assignment number one. And if you have any questions about that, you could email them to me. Or um, if you want to sign up to the Facebook page, you can um, send me a message in Facebook, either a private message or we could do group chat if you want to discuss as a class some of the ideas um, in this assignment or any of the other assignments for that matter. Uh, right, so Verstehen is a concept that was proposed um, by Max Weber initially, and it's a German word that means to have a deep understanding of something. So he didn't make the word up, it's a real German word. He was just the first person to start applying it in the realm of sociology. And from there it went out to the social sciences in general, and it is applied in a number of other social sciences as well as in sociology. Um, to have a deep understanding is to try and walk in somebody else's shoes, to try and understand how they see the world um, as a, a participant or if you prefer as a subject, so that they are not a thing to study, they are an active agent in the process of being studied, which is an important issue in, it, in and of itself. And what that essentially means is that if you are an active agent, let's say you're being studied by a sociologist at some point in the future, then you're not just like a chemical in the test tube that sits there passively and gets studied and you, you just sit there in your chest tube and, and do nothing. You are an engaged participant. You are a, quite obviously, a real human being. And whilst that might seem like a blatantly silly thing to say, it's very easy for people engaged in research and study to come to treat the object of their study as a, a thing, an object. Um, and to forget, temporarily at least, that they are actually studying a real human being with thoughts and feelings and emotions and ideas of their own and free will and all the rest of those things that make us into a human being. Um, you kind of get lost in the lab coat and the clipboard and the, the scientific approach, which is very used to studying objects, to studying things like chemicals in test tubes, and shifting that attitude to the study of a human being or a whole bunch of human beings requires the researcher to bear in mind that these people have ideas of their own. So we've discussed in previous lectures things like the Hawthorne effect, whereby the person being studied is very self-conscious that they are being studied, and that leads them to change their behavior in some way, which could be to um, try to impress the studier, impress the researcher, uh, make a, a good impression upon them, or for some people they might go in the opposite direction and be deliberately awkward and cantankerous because they don't really want to be studied, or maybe they just want to make a bit of a uh, kind of a, a rebellious bad boy, bad girl as the case may be, impression on the person studying them. So you've got to factor all those things into account when you are conducting your sociological research particularly especially if you're um, coming from the Schwerstein standpoint that this individual wants to be studied, you've approached them, you've asked them, they've consented, so they are engaged in the process, which might of course, let's face it, mean that they are in some way different from some other person that you approached, asked to study, and who said no, they didn't want to be studied. So is somebody who does want to be studied somehow noticeably substantially different from a person who doesn't want to be studied and does that have an impact on the nature of the information you find from them 
you, you could think particularly uh, the the issue we've raised in criminal psychology and criminal sociology, where the, you have this problem with a prison population that the, the research within criminology is, is very heavily focused on people in prison and studying them. And is there a noticeable difference, we've discussed this several times, between criminals who get caught and criminals who get away with it, who cannot be studied because nobody currently knows that they have indeed committed some crime or another. Is one perhaps a very different type of person from the other and therefore the information gathered from studying a captive population of prisoners would not automatically transfer over to being useful to the study or investigation or capture of more successful criminals who don't get caught, who get away with it. But maybe there's something about them that enables them to get away with it that makes them different from the people who get caught. Um, plus, of course, with a, a, a captive population, they are usually very, very bored being locked up all day. And so they might start making stuff up just to keep the attention of a researcher, keep you coming back, because it breaks up their day, it gives them something else to do, they might enjoy talking about their crimes for less than, what should we say, sanitary reasons. They might get, get their jollies reflecting and reminiscing on their crimes, especially if they're horrible crimes, really quite gruesome crimes. And maybe they enjoy seeing the look of horror on the researcher's face. There's all sorts of other things going on there, which is this idea of Verstein, that they're not just some passive lump that is being studied they are engaged in the process. They might lie to you, they might mislead you, they might um, ladle it on with a trowel and exaggerate because they want to keep your attention for all sorts of reasons that are not directly connected to the thing that you want to study. So it's just being aware of all of that. Um, it goes a little further in that you're not, we have said this several times in lectures already, you're not trying to make a judgment call about them. You're finding out what they think about the world and why they do what they do. You are not agreeing with them, you're not approving of their motivations and their reasoning, nor are you disagreeing with them or challenging them or um, saying that they are fundamentally wrong. Even if quite privately you think they are wrong or privately you think they are right, you're making a conscious effort in your research and your report write up to be neutral, to describe rather than to judge, essentially. And it is seeing the world from their point of view, but we'll get onto another angle of this momentarily. Um, the difference with the other term you've got on the screen there, Verstand, is that Verstand is an intellectual, slightly dry process. You know what somebody said, you've, you've listened to them, and I mean that in the sense that um, counsellors and therapists mean listen. You're not just sort of sitting there thinking about, oh, did I pay the gas bill, whilst they're chatting away and the words are just kind of washing over you. You are actively listening, you've heard what they've said, but in a rather distant sort of a way in Verstein. So academically, intellectually, you know what they've said, but you don't feel it. You don't really get what it's like to be there. You've just listened to the words, written stuff down, and you've got a, an outsider's point of view. And I'll explain that again in slightly more depth momentarily. Um, the bit there about human actors are not simply shaped by external forces, that's to factor in that individuals are influenced by biology, they're influenced by their upbringing, but they're also influenced by factors like free choice, their own understanding, their own view. The way we understand the world today shapes how we will act with the world tomorrow. So we're not just kind of blindly responding to the world. An optimist will react with the world in a different way to a pessimist will react with the world. So the same event can be understood by two different individuals quite distinctly because they're coming from two very different points of view, two very different understandings of what the world is and what the world involves. So that's something you have to think about. And you might, thinking slightly further ahead here, when you get on to doing assignment number two, and I know some of you have already actually conducted your interviews, but for those who haven't, and even those who have, who've yet to write up the report about the interviews, what you're trying to do in that interview process is to see the world from the standpoint of the person you are interviewing. Not to agree with them, not to disagree with them, but to understand how they see the world, which will then help to explain why they do what they do. 
on. Jörg Simmel, another um, German sociologist, emphasized this and said it's it's very important to understand people on their terms rather than to think about them from outside terms. So, for example, um, the the one you got there about an atheist studying a Christian churchgoer. So let's, let's imagine you've got Joe Bloggs, who is the sociologist, who is a, a real sort of hardline atheist, doesn't believe in anything whatsoever, who comes, comes along and studies Mary, who goes to church, and it's a, let's say it's a Pentecostal church, where they believe very passionately, very ardently in the existence of demons who cause people problems and take possession of people, and reasonably regularly within the church they engage in exorcisms to cast demons out of people and so Joe Bloggs is interviewing Mary about her point of view now there's to illustrate how this might be approached if Joe Bloggs is going for a verstand point of view so that dry intellectual outsider's point of view he'll ask her a load of questions he'll write down the answers and when she's saying uh, last last Sunday, the the pastor at the church exercised a demon from so and so person in the congregation, and I watched it, and I, I was singing hymns and praying along and trying to help the pastor and, and so forth. Joe Bloggs might be noting down because Joe Bloggs doesn't believe in the existence of demons whatsoever. He's an atheist. He might be noting down that um, Mary appears to believe in this however the demon is symbolic of this and that and the other and her belief in god is maybe uh, reflective of freud's argument that god is actually a father figure and a form of transference from the actual actual human father to a, a, an abstract divine father and it's a way of playing out father issues father fixations uh, maybe the demon is symbolic of the shadow side of the individuals within the church and talks about Mary's experience in that way. So using terms, phrases, ideas which Mary herself possibly might not understand or even if she did understand them might not agree with, he would in effect be explaining Mary's experience away in a way that she might not be wholly happy with if she were to sit down and read Joe Bloggs is right up later. Now, if Joe Bloggs is going for more Verstehen, that kind of, um, in trying to get an insider's point of view, trying to get a more in-depth understanding of what's going on in Mary's life, he doesn't have to agree with Mary that demons exist. Um, rather, he just has to say that Mary herself is absolutely convinced that the demon is real and could reflect on the purpose of the ceremony at the church on the Sunday, what the prayers were for, what the hymns were for, um, how Mary understood her role in the exorcism as a member of the congregation, in, in that sense that she says she felt she was helping the pastor. Um, what does Mary believe a demon is? He could ask those sorts of questions and Mary could give answers and explain. He could say, well, this is an embodiment of evil and Mary's understanding of evil is that the demon causes that let's say mental illness or something or another and talk about it in that context so in other words Joe Bloggs is not trying to explain Mary's point of view away rather to explain how Mary herself understands her beliefs her faith her practices and how those beliefs motivate her actions such as going to church and praying and participating in the exorcism, how maybe her belief in demons might um, alter what she does. Maybe she does things to protect herself from demons, let alone help other people who are possessed, or at least who she believes are possessed. Um, maybe she has prayers she says at night, things like that that she does, um, all sorts of things she could engage with that are shaped and formed by her beliefs and her perceptions. But in other words, understanding the world on her terms, rather than trying to say she's, she's wrong and here is a more objective, more accurate explanation of her beliefs. Hopefully that makes some degree of sense. Um, the 
theory of mind is something that arises as a concept in psychology but applies to other forms of social science as well. Um, people like Jean Piaget, the child psychologist, argued that very, very young children do not have an accurate theory of mind. In fact, they don't really have one at all. What is a theory of mind? If um, Hopefully you've touched on Jean Piaget in the first year. I can't quite remember if you do or not. Um, but his, his argument was theorified is that we have an understanding that other people think differently from us. So if, if I really like fudge, I know that there are other weird, strange, disturbed people in the world who do not like fudge. So just because I'm enjoying something and, and eating the fudge, I know that not everyone will enjoy it. Because I believe and vote for one particular political party, I perfectly aware that other people don't vote for that party and don't like that poli those politicians and think they're you know, dishonest and this, that and the other. I have a religious conviction. I know lots of other people don't share it. And so things that I believe to be true, I'm quite aware that other people think are completely crazy and weird and strange. So it, it's my understanding that other people's minds are different from my minds. That things I know about, they won't necessarily know about. Things that I care about, they won't necessarily care about, and vice versa. Stuff that's important to them won't be important to me. So things that I think are complete rubbish, I'm aware that other people in the world passionately believe in, whether in terms of religion or politics or science or whatever else. So I'm quite aware that other people have different minds. But Piaget said we're not born knowing that. It's not something that a three-month-old baby comprehends. It's something that the child, as they grow older, starts to learn. And he conducted a series of experiments to try and work out when, in a child's life on average, they start to develop a theory of mind. And others, other researchers later on also came up with their own kind of experiments and spins on this. Um, so one famous example he did, which you, hopefully some of you at least, will be aware of. Uh, bear in mind he lived in Switzerland, and uh, Switzerland is a very mountainous country. He made a paper mache mountain in a classroom, small one, obviously, and he put a teddy bear in one chair and got a small child to come in and sit in a different chair and then showed the kid a series of photographs. And he said to the child, which one of these photographs shows the side of the mountain that the teddy bear can see? And the children had to point to one of these photographs and only one of them was correct. And very young children normally pointed to the photograph showing the side of the mountain that they could see from the chair they were sitting in, not necessarily from the perspective of the bear. It was criticised slightly by other psychologists later, thinking that maybe he had phrased the question in a confusing way, and therefore his argument that kids don't really get this sense of theory of mind and, until roughly around the age of five-ish. Other people said, no, they, they do, kids do get a theory of mind much earlier than that. It's just that the way Piaget conducted the experiment led the kids to give incorrect answers. Different points of view. Um, there's another experiment done by another researcher involving a tube of Smarties. And the, the, they show the tube of Smarties to a kid and then they open the tube of Smarties up and empty it. And instead of Smarties coming out of the tube, there are pencils. And then they put the pencils back in and stuff the lid on and they say to the child, oh, when, when little Susie comes into the room and I show her this tube of Smarties, what will she think is inside the tube of Smarties? And depending on the age of the kids, some of them say pencils and some of them say Smarties. The argument being that the kids who say Smarties are starting to realise that little Susie won't understand what they understand because little Susie won't have seen the pencils inside the tube the way they have. Little Susie will just assume a Smarties tube contains Smarties the way they did when they very first saw the Smarties tube. Um, other children, the ones who say pencils, tend to assume that because they know there are pencils in the tube, therefore little Susie will inexplicably know that there are pencils in the tube as well because what they think, Susie must think. So that's the difference between someone who's got a theory of mind and someone who doesn't. And it's not just in children. There are adults who struggle to have a theory of mind due to um, neurological functioning issues that their, their brain doesn't work in quite the same way that other people's brains work. 
and, and sometimes people with mental illnesses and things like that can sporadically, depending on the nature of the mental illness, sporadically struggle to understand other people think differently from themselves. So Vreshtahen is a concept that fits in with theory of mind. We understand the subject, the person we're studying, does not think like we think. And we need to get into their head. So we, we acknowledge this theory of mind and we're trying to get into their mind to see the world as they see it. Not everyone says that this is either feasible or reasonable, indeed. It's, it's a, a challenging notion. Uh, Heidegger was one of the people who said, well, you know, have a try at it, it's, it's worth a try, but do be aware that it's very easy to start projecting your own assumptions onto other people. To start to think, let's say for argument's sake, go for a grim example, let's say you're conducting a study into domestic violence and you're faced with turn it on its head you're faced with a man who has been beaten up by his wife several times and put in hospital and she's smashed him in the head with a frying pan and stabbed him and all sorts but he keeps going back to her and you want to know why this man keeps going back to his violent wife and he'll give you his reasons but it's very easy to start thinking well what on earth would lead me to keep doing that and you think to yourself, well, I would only do it if, dot, dot, dot. And therefore, because you would do it for this reason, you start to think he must be doing it for the same reason, which is projecting. Saying, in other words, rather than listening to his actual reasons for why he does what he does, you start to assume that he must have the same kind of motivation and thinking processes that you would have if you were in that situation. which clearly defeats the point of Verstehen, if you're just protecting. Uh, and Heidegger says it's very, very hard to stop thinking like yourself and start fully listening to somebody else and understanding why they do what they do, why they think what they think, how they perceive the world from their angle. Other people, including Dilphi, who are going all the way back to the Victorian era, have flagged up another issue that how many of us genuinely understand ourselves so you're, you're putting this person on the spot you're sitting them down you're interviewing them and saying well why do you do this why do you think that blah 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 assuming that that person has got a clue why they think what they think why they do what they do not everybody does so many people um certainly i I've, I've had this situation in my life and quite possibly Many of you have had similar situations where you've done something and then afterwards you've got absolutely no idea why you've done it. You know you've done it, but you can't think for the life of you why you did that. And it may be something you did 10 minutes earlier, or it may be you sitting there reflecting on stuff you did five years, 10 years, 20 years ago, thinking, why on earth did I do that? Why, why did I date that person? when they are patently so awful. How could I have imagined they were lovely at the time? And you have problems re re recalling why you thought they were lovely when nowadays you look at them and you think they're terrible people and, and you can't think what the attraction must have been or what various decisions, judgments you've made in the past where you, you're really struggling to think, why on earth did I do that? Dilthi's ar argument in part is that a lot of us operate on what these days I suppose we'd call autopilot. We just kind of track along through life doing stuff with very little conscious reasoning as to why we do it. It builds essentially on Sigmund Freud's argument that to a large extent we are unconscious beings and we do things for unconscious reasons that our conscious mind doesn't really comprehend most of the time. And so when you put somebody on the spot in an interview and ask them a question, they might draw a blank. And they could be completely honest with you and say, I've got no idea what the answer to that question is. Just don't know why I do this. I, I do it, but I don't know why I do it. However, a lot of people don't like being put on the spot. More importantly, they don't like feeling clueless. They are not comfortable admitting to a, a stranger that they 
don't understand themselves. They've got no idea why they do what they do. So they might start to spontaneously create motivations. So that in, in a matter of a, a few seconds, they're sitting there thinking, well, why on earth did I do that? Oh, well, it must have been for oh, this reason. And they'll give you a reason which sounds vaguely plausible, at least to them. And they hope you find it vaguely plausible as well. And it quite possibly is not the reason why they did the behaviour or, or why they think what they think when that behaviour was performed or when that pattern of ideas was formed. That they've just plucked a reason out of thin air because up until that very moment when you asked them that question, they've never thought about it. They've been too busy getting on with life to sit and philosophise and self-reflect and study their own navel and think about their own motivations. Does that make the uh, the answer they give you invalid or worthless? Well, possibly it does, but um, it's it's worth noting that sometimes the things people make up on the spur of the moment are quite reflective in and of themselves. Not necessarily reflective of why they did the behaviour you're questioning them about, but reflective of how they're thinking in that moment and the sort of ideas that are going through their head in that moment. So it can still give you an insight into the person you're interviewing. It's just not necessarily an insight about the question you've actually asked them. That's human nature. And, and Dilthi essentially says that's something we just have to kind of live with and get on with. Um, Dilthi also quite influenced in this, this angle, this way by Freud to an extent, in that Freud argues that it's very difficult to understand yourself. You can't see the wood for the trees. Your own unconscious motivations are constantly evading you. And so it's useful to go into therapy. And one of the useful reasons to, to go into therapy is so that the therapist can give you an objective explanation of why you do what you do. So you tell your dreams and your feelings and your experiences and your what have you to your psychotherapist and they, as an objective outsider, explain it back to you. Because you will not understand yourself, the therapist understands you better than you understand yourself. Dolphy uses the phrase, besser verse to him. To have a better understanding, besser means better. A better understanding of you than you have of yourself. And now whether that's a therapist, or whether it's a sociologist, or whether it's a best friend, or the vicar, or the dog, or whoever, it's an argument we can make that sometimes other people have a better grasp of us than we have of ourselves. They, they can see our motivations and our behaviours and our, our drives more uh, objectively, more accurately than we see ourselves because we're so wrapped up in the moment, we're so wrapped up in intense and often confusing emotions and trundling along like these mostly unconscious machines that Freud described, that we perhaps have a very skewed, very misleading understanding of ourselves. And we, we give we give ourselves motivations like the one you've got on the screen. I did it because I love him. We say that to ourselves, and that may not be the real reason at all, but it's, it sounds plausible at the time we say it to ourselves. And even if we say that, even if we give that as an answer to a, a, an interview from a sociologist, as an answer, it doesn't necessarily explain an awful lot. Okay, you've done something because you love a person. Okay, what does love actually mean to you in the context of that behaviour? Because people do all sorts of things for love. They might buy a bunch of flowers and a box of chocolates for love. They might put a cyanide in, in a dose of cyanide in someone's coffee for love. They might rescue a drowning child for love, but equally they might push somebody else under a bus for love. There's all sorts of behaviours that go on, which are done in the name of love, which, from a more objective point of view, don't always seem terribly loving. But love, as that individual understands it, maybe, given that some people's expression of love can be quite damaging. It's not all mills and boons. Sometimes it can be intensely possessive and borderline psychotic in its intensity. 
Uh, an element to think about um, is Emmanuel Levinas, who was a philosopher rather than a um, sociologist in this context. An ethicist who, who contemplated the nature of human existence uh, made the argument um, in in French this time rather than in German that the basis of human compassion and decency is the tête-à-tête, -tête, the face-to-face, -face, the head-to-head -head meeting. Um, without getting too abstract, because I could witter about this for hours, but I won't. You'll be relieved to hear. Um, Levinas says that for most of human existence, 99% of human existence, all communication is essentially taking place face to face. Up until recently, very few people could read and write. Up until recently, telephones didn't exist, computers didn't exist, all of these non-face to face forms of communication did not exist. So the vast majority of people, if they wanted to communicate with another human being, had to go along and see them and talk to them face to face. And part of that, he says, when you're talking face to face with someone, and you might reflect on this in terms of your social media interactions with, with other people, if you tell a joke, you can see them laugh. If you tell a joke, they can see you and get your tone of voice and your body language, and they can sense that it is a joke. Whether they find it funny or not is another question, but they can sense at least that you're trying to joke. Whereas if you tell a joke on social media, a lot of people will take you at face value and think you're being serious. They won't twig that you are joking. Likewise, if you're being sarcastic, they can sense that when it's face to face. Um, they can sense when you're saying something to be funny or when you're saying something to be angry or when you're saying something to be kind and compassionate. So the words themselves do not convey the context. It's, or it's the body language, the, the tone of voice, the facial expressions, all of that that conveys the context and totally changes the meaning of something which you don't get when it's just words on a screen or words on a page. And a key element of this is if you say something to a person that's really nasty and unpleasant, you'll see them get upset. You'll see that the, their face flushing as if they get angry or they get tearful or they get whatever. You get the sense that this person is, is not happy with what you've just said to them. And therefore you might backtrack. You might, not everyone does clearly, but you might. Compare that to say Twitter and Facebook and all of these things where people get horrible, beyond horrible to absolute strangers. They say the vilest, most awful vindictive things and they go on and on and on against an individual uh, and sometimes it has resulted in people committing suicide because of the dreadful things that have been said to them would we behave like that to another person if we were sat in the same room as them if they burst into tears we'd probably stop or if they got up and were preparing to smash our face in because we would said something so awful we'd probably stop so we'd, we'd check ourselves and part of that is not just the, the worry that someone's going to thump you if you say the wrong thing but it's also the realization that what you're saying has an impact emotionally it may make them very happy it may make them very sad and that understanding of other people's emotions if you like that theory of mind but at a more emotional level rather than an intellectual level is where we start developing compassion for other people we learn that we can hurt other people we learn that it's not nice to see other people upset and crying and, and, and hurt and wounded and one thing and another. Therefore, we, it's only by seeing the impact of our actions that we begin to develop a sense of compassion and learn to change our actions, learn to amend our actions. Uh, and for Levinas, that has to be done through face-to-face -face contact. Now, in his lifetime, he, he um, died before the internet really became quite the thing it is these days, but certainly phone communication, uh, snail mail letters communication, that sort of thing, was a phenomenon that he ex was concerned about as to whether it would fully, would it, would it put a barrier to the development of compassion or would we still be able to be compassionate through non-face-to-face -face communication? And one thing you might want to think about, especially at the moment with the the whole kind of quarantining, lockdown, social isolation situation that's going on in the country at the moment. 
you might end up having to conduct your interviews by email or by telephone rather than face to face because you're no longer able to meet face to face. So is an interview, a sociological interview that is not conducted face to face, less capable of Verstehen than one that is capable, oh uh, sorry, is conducted face to face? So if you can't actually see the person you're talking to, you can't establish rapport with them in that way, you're doing it by email or by phone or by, by whatever other distant means, do you lack that immediacy of sitting in the same room, watching the person they see you, you see them, and perhaps if we go down Levinus's argument, Verstehen has the capacity to develop. How else can we develop Verstehen? Well, one argument is that you need to make sure you are understanding the point of view of the other person emotionally, not just intellectually. So where you, you have a semi-structured or an unstructured interview, you can put aside your prepared schedule of questions and say, hang on a second, you just said so-and-so to me, did you mean this? And so you kind of go off script to double check that you have understood what they meant because you want to get really a, a real in-depth insight into the view of the world and what they mean and so forth. And they can say, oh no, I didn't mean that, I meant so-and-so. And so they can clarify and you can get a lot of depth there. Potentially, of course, they might also get slightly narked and say, how very dare you suggest that I meant so-and-so thing. Of course I didn't mean that at all, you silly person. I meant this depends on quite how, how they react to your misunderstanding of what they meant. And that could possibly derail an interview. The question of stepping in the same river twice, that's a, um, a metaphor used within Buddhism. Uh, can you have the same experience twice? So the person is, is rattling off a, 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 an answer to a question you pose them, and you sit there and you have, you have a pause for a couple of two minutes while you think about what they've said. And then you come back to them and say, well, did you mean this? And they give you an answer, yes or no. But that's a few minutes ahead. The waters of the river have moved. The river in this case being their consciousness. So when they're explaining or re-explaining what they meant five minutes later, are they giving you exactly what they meant five minutes earlier? Or has their just listening to your misunderstanding changed? how they think about the issue in that couple of few minutes. And so when they give you a, a repeated explanation, are they giving you something slightly different from what they meant first time around? So it, put it in, in a broader context, the way I think about um, politics, let's say, like we haven't mentioned the B word in a while, the way I think I thought about Brexit yesterday might not be the way I think about Brexit today. So if I'm asked a question yesterday and I'm asked a question today about Brexit, I might give slightly different, I mean, it could be exactly the same answer, but it might be slightly different answers. And, and so when somebody says, oh, I, I don't quite understand what you said yesterday when I asked you about this thing. If my thoughts and feelings have changed, do I repeat verbatim what I said yesterday or do I give an updated answer that effectively dismisses what I said yesterday and puts a different point of view without necessarily realising that I am dismissing what I said yesterday. Because we tend to live, it's very easy to think that or to assume that what I think right now about an issue is possibly what I've always thought about that issue. And we forget that sometimes our ideas change quite a lot over the course of days or weeks or months or years about given issues. So do you always get the same thing twice? Or are on the second, third, however many occasions you're having to re-ask a thing, do you get a different response without either the person giving the response or possibly you hearing the response, realising it is a different response, a response that has flowed on to a different position in some way? Something to think about. There's no clear-cut answers to any of this. And whilst it is all a bit airy-fairy abstract, 
you can include elements of this in your report, your write-up, to say, did you conduct your interviews face-to-face? If so, does this improve the version? Did you have to conduct an interview by email because you know, the global situation, blah, blah. Therefore, does that lack Verstehen or were you able to nonetheless somehow acquire it? If so, how did you acquire it? So you can start addressing those issues. And if you did a semi-structured or unstructured interview, well, can't be an unstructured one because we had to agree a set of questions. So if you did a semi-structured interview where you added in questions that weren't written down on your sheet, you might want to mention that fact and say that additional questions were used to clarify or, or go into greater depth on particular issues that weren't immediately obvious. And so you've got this kind of ongoing developmental issue. Do you want to touch on Dilthi's argument? You might, whether you stick with Dilthi or you go for one of the more recent people who said something similar. In other words, you've, you've put this person on the spot. Let's say you're doing that set of questions about um, dieting for argument's sake and you, you've put them on the spot you've asked them these questions how confident are you that they, they knew the answers themselves beforehand that you, they didn't just sort of make something up on the spur of the moment rather than admit that they had no idea what the answer to a question was do you feel that you're getting an insight into their ongoing pattern of thinking or have you almost led them to create a pattern of thinking simply by putting them on the spot and they are then obliged to start thinking about something they previously hadn't given a second thought to. Which does pose some interesting ethical questions if you're actually the very process of interviewing someone could change that person and possibly change them in ways they, they might not thank you for. Okay, a little bit about content analysis, because we've mentioned this several times in previous weeks, so this is just a little bit to add on to what we've previously said. Um, you've got two main types, conceptual content analysis and relational content analysis. Now, what we've spoken about previously is mainly conceptual content analysis. So just to remind you, in case you've forgotten, content analysis um, is where you are potentially looking at an interview or quite often it's a set of documents like newspapers, books, diaries, journals, whatever kind of documents you're looking at, and you're looking for patterns of meaning in those documents. Now, that kind of um, patterns of meaning, conceptual concepts, ideas, patterns of meaning. So you can, how often do concepts crop up in a pattern of meaning? What's important, what's not important, and so forth. You Normally, you would do that in an explicit manner. So you are going through your interviews, for example, looking for what is definitely there, what is actually said. And with the newspaper analysis, um, you're, you're kind of doing, you're doing it explicitly. You're looking at what is actually said in the newspapers for the first assignment. We are not at this stage doing implicit conceptual analysis, although that is something you might want to think about for your dissertation next year. Implicit is where you're reading between the lines, not to find what's actually there on the page, but to get a hint of, of what's underlying what is being said. And there, obviously, you do have a tremendous potential to go astray and start reading all kinds of things into what someone said or what someone's written that they never meant in the first place. When you start projecting your own active imagination rather than reading what is there and so it's, it's, it's something you have to be cautious about when you're doing implicit coding that you're not just making it up as you go along that you are quite reasonably picking up on notions that are being hinted at or suggested or implied but never outwardly upfrontly stated this is where triangulation is useful to have a second third person read through the same material and see if they can spot what you spotted. And if they do, then that gives you a sense that maybe it's not just you making it up as you're going along. Maybe other people are seeing something that is actually there as well. Um, whether you're using implicit or explicit, in the methodology you talk about the rationale for how you, why you, why you have highlighted certain words or phrases or concepts rather than others. So did you start out with an agenda to look for certain things? Or were you doing a um, grounded theory light approach 
where you had no agenda, you just read what you read a few times and let notions and concepts emerge because they were there, not because you were deliberately looking for particular things, particular concepts. Relational content analysis looks at the patterning of a text and how words and ideas and phrases relate to each other. Um, effect extraction, you're looking at um, the emotional angle. So it, does a person appear to be angry or sad, hopeful or despairing, happy or, or um, bored or, or any other kind of emotion? How can you draw emotion out of a text? Uh, out of the, the words used or, or possibly this text with photographs and imagery. Do the, does the imagery convey emotion? How do you de derive that emotion? Does it change the nature of the text you're looking at? All of that sort of thing. So a little bit like what we were doing with those two um, images, the one from Banksy and the one from National Geographic um, the other week when we were looking at the kind of the emotional impact of what they, those images were trying to convey. Proximity analysis uh, is where you're looking at patterns that repeat quite close to each other. And this is something where Atlas TI program is quite useful. So in other words, if, if a phrase crops up in a paragraph, does another phrase crop up within a sentence or two? And so you start to see a pattern wherever one thing is said, that other thing is said quite quickly afterwards. And Atlas is quite good at, at flagging up when words appear quite close to each other in a relationship to each other uh, and therefore there is an implied relationship that's what's called relational content analysis between these different notions and these different ideas of how they interrelate to each other um, particularly if you're looking at quite lengthy texts so if you've got a lot of newspaper articles or you, you were doing this for example um, analyzing novels or something of that sort where, where it's quite wordy it's quite long so you're looking at a lot of content if it's just one short interview proximity analysis isn't terribly useful if you're engaging in proximity analysis um, cognitive mapping is quite useful can be used for effect extraction as well but more, more so um, proximity analysis uh, it's, it's a way of creating a, a visual image to put into your report that the reader can then mull over. So this is an example, I just stole this one off the net, of cognitive mapping. Now, on this particular one, you can see you've got blue lines and reddish lines. Uh, I, I um, couldn't find an explanation to go with this. I don't quite know what the colour symbolism here is. But the blue lines will mean one thing and the reddish lines will mean another. You've got directional arrows relating one idea to another and sometimes it's um, in two different directions so for example if you find the box that says first responders and the box that says disaster awareness and planning um, there are arrows going in both directions to show that first responders i.e paramedics um, are involved in disaster awareness and planning and um, there's an interrelationship between when disasters happen how we plan for them and the people who carry out those plans, the paramedics, the first responders. So it's an interrelationship one. Whereas, let's say if you found a box for um, visitors and the box for businesses, there's a an arrow but only going in one direction from visitor to businesses. So the visitors turn up at the um, parks and beaches and, and various places, these outdoor places, and they spend money in the businesses so they go to the local shops and they spend money in the shops so it is from the visitor to the shops to the business goes in one direction the black boxes you've got there some of them are plus signs and some of them are minus signs the plus signs indicate that it is a positive relationship so going back to the visitors and businesses the one um, it's of benefit to the businesses for the visitors to go and spend money there. Fairly obvious one. Some of them are negative, so the relationship between visitors and beaches, that with that red, or red orange arrow going down, has a minus sign on it. So the implication there is that the more visitors you get going to the beaches, the 
less beneficial it is to the beach as a natural environment. I suppose they probably leaving rubbish behind them and, and I don't know, trampling the beaches down and maybe causing erosion or something like that. So that they're, they're having a negative impact on the beaches if you get too many visitors, that sort of thing. So you, you could create a cognitive map potentially, um, possibly for your coursework here, but more likely it's something you could use for your dissertation. Um, that would demonstrate how to interrelate different ideas to each other, which ideas are close to each other, which ideas relate to each other in a positive way or a negative way, and you could use colour-coded arrows to signify different notions of meaning and concept and relationship between them. Um, Atlas is a, one of the programs that you can utilise to create a cognitive map, although you could actually also do this in um, Microsoft Word, it just take longer. That you could do it. So there's, there's different ways of doing it anyway. So this is just to flag up the existence of these things should you want to use them at some point in the future. Okay, draw breath. So moving on to laying out your assignment and this is just for number one. The second assignment is not dissimilar to this but put second assignment on the back burner for the time being and, and focus on the first assignment. So you start with your abstract, which would be a nice short single paragraph. Move on to your introduction. Finish your introduction with your aims. What is the aim of your research? Um, you can put that as bullet points and one sentence per aim. And some people make the mistake where they, they put two or three aim, um, sentences and overcomplicate their aim by actually sort of squadget, squishing two aims into one aim. Don't do that, just have one aim per bullet point, one sentence per bullet point. Then your hypothesis, your methodology, we'll go over these sections momentarily. Methodology breaks down into those various different sections there. Then into your discussion, draw it up with a conclusion, follow it with a short reflection, bung in your appendix, which should include your code schedule and your manual. I'll explain those in a minute. And then finish with your references as standard. So if you want to pause the screen, jot these things down, and then play again when you want to move on to the explanation of each one in slightly more depth. So, moving on. Slightly more depth. The aims. What are your... So you've, you, you've um, put in your abstract there. Your introduction is where you flag up your theories. Who are the, the main theorists? Like Dukes, people like that that you will be using to analyze the reporting of crime in newspapers and towards the end of that introduction section you have your aims um, a name for most of you well actually all of you really should be to compare news reporting in local papers and in national papers so that would be one you can have a second potentially a third aim i wouldn't go more than three because you don't two thousand words it's difficult to, the more aims you have, the more you've got to write about them. So you, know, you don't want to sort of um, run out of word count before you've addressed your aims. Your second aim, you could, for example, choose to look at issues of gender. You could look at issues of age. You could look at issues relating to a particular style of crime. Let's say the reporting of murders or the reporting of bank robberies or whatever it might be that you were interested in. You could look at any kind of demographic factor to do with the victim or demographic factors to do with the criminals and the suspects. Um, there are other angles you could go at, but I'd suggest those are probably the fairly straightforward ones to focus on. So you just state those as nice, simple, one-sentence aims. Your hypothesis, you might have one, you might have two. I wouldn't suggest more than two. It will over-complicate matters are essentially there will be a difference in the reporting of so-and-so type of crime or crimes committed by so-and-so type of person or crimes committed against so-and-so type of person. Or equally, your hypothesis might be that there is not a difference in the reporting. Um, so, you, you, for example, you could say there will be a difference in the reporting of... Um, property crime between national papers and 
local papers. Or you could say there will be a difference in reporting between um, crimes of violence against women and crimes of violence against men. Or you could say there will be a difference in crime reporting between um, crimes carried out by um, white offenders and crimes carried out by Asian offenders, something like that. So you could hypothesize a difference in the reporting of a particular type of crime and then essentially what you do is to, as well as giving a general overview of crime reporting in the papers, focus in on that particular type of crime and say, is there a difference in how they report it? And that difference could be frequency, how often they're reported, but it could also potentially be the, the, the language used to report them, or, or factors such as do they include photographs of the victim, photographs of the offenders, for some types of crime, but not for other types of crime. You could look in different angles like that. Then into the methodology itself. Now you need to keep your methodology nice, short, straightforward, to the point, as always. So you start with your design subheading, and your design for all of you is a quantitative descriptive content analysis. Um, but put that as a sentence, not just as four words. Put it as a sentence and states what particular angle you're coming from. So is it a content analysis of um, the reporting of, of murders or a content analysis of the reporting of crimes committed by women or crimes committed against women or whatever angle you want to come from. So flesh that out for a sentence. But you know, um, a precise sentence rather than the waffly sentence. Next subheading, you move into your ethics. Now you should state that you did not need to fill in an ethics form to go before the board because this is archival research. In other words, you're looking at old newspapers you're not engaging in any research involving living subjects or participants. Therefore, it doesn't need ethics approval. But you might want to flag up, depending on quite what angle you're going from on this, that you yourself as a researcher are in affected, impacted by the nature of what you're studying. So you've had to sit there and read through a dozen or more newspapers of tales of, of murder and molestation and, and torture and god knows what else that could have an effect on you does it give you nightmares for those of you old enough to remember Shaw Taylor that's about two of you <laughs> he used to be a, a chap who presented um, a, a late night program about crime he would always finish by saying don't have nightmares could you be giving yourself nightmares by studying these things? If so, what do you need to do about it? What have you done about it? You could flag that up as an issue. Then move into data collection. So if your data collection subheading, you need to state which newspapers you have used. And I suggest you put the national newspapers in one sentence and the local newspapers in another sentence to keep them in separate boxes, as it were. And you would say the dates of the newspapers are running from Monday the so-and-so date to Sunday the so-and-so date. Um, and whether you had, well, I don't know, maybe you had five copies of the Sun and three copies of the East Anglian Daily Times or one of each or how, you know, essentially say how many papers, which newspapers, the dates of the newspapers. Then mention a particular focus that you are taking, assuming of course you are taking a particular focus. So you say, whilst all crimes were counted, the primary focus of the research was on um, arson, or shoplifting, or uh, badger baiting, whatever it is that you've chosen to look at. Then you move on to your data recording, subheading, where you say you have used manifest coding, which is where you're looking at what's actually there, explicit coding, manifest coding, to study what's there. And you've created a uh, schedule and a manual, which can be seen in page so-and-so of the appendix. And give very, very brief um, summation of the kind of things that you have mentioned in your schedule. That'll be more obvious when I show you what the schedule should look like. You'll get the gist of that then. Um, then you move on to finally your data analysis and findings section. So 
It's content analysis, so you count the crimes, the descriptive stats applied. So you don't have to mention every single thing, you're just giving a, a swift summary of what you're saying. So, um, in the course of the analysis, X many murders were counted, X many bank robberies, X many um, drunken disorderly incidences, etc, etc. And this is where you might want to bring in your graphs and tables. One is fine, but two or three is, is even better. And those graphs and tables could relate to the specific angle you're taking. So if you are particularly interested in crimes of violence committed against men, then you could have a table that displays that information. If you are particularly interested in um, crimes involving property damage, you could have a table explicitly showing that. So you wouldn't need a table for every single thing, just tables that show the angle that you're concentrating on for the analysis. So far, hopefully so good, but as, as I've said several times, if you want to ask questions, do so by email or link up to my Facebook work profile, and then you can send in questions by messenger, either as individuals, or you can use the group chat facility if you want, if, especially if several of you have got the same questions, rather than me kind of answering the same thing five times over, I can just say it once and then five of you, ten of you, however many of you can hear it all at the same time. Or read it rather all at the same time. Um, as you go along you might want to mention what content analysis is good for and where it's weak. So in terms of what content analysis is useful for, you can say it's good at surveying a large amount of data. You looked at a lot of newspapers. Uh, and summarized lots of information from those newspapers. And it's quite useful if you want to make broad generalizations that what's true of a week's worth of newspapers is probably true of any other week's worth of newspapers. And so the theories that you generate from this week's worth of newspapers could easily apply to newspapers published at other points in the year. Um, where you have problems with content analysis is that you are just surveying reported data. You've got no idea what the journalists were thinking when they, or what journalist editors, were thinking when they put that information in the papers because you're not interviewing them. You're not conducting surveys with them. You're just looking at their written work. You're not trying to get some insight into the people who wrote it. So when they reported this murder and they wrote it up in such and such a way, you don't know why they did that, why they wrote it up in that way, because you haven't interviewed them. So you're not getting that kind of um, Verstehen depth of understanding from the journalists. Nor are you looking at accuracy. So if the, um, the Daily Mail tells you that a post office was robbed on Thursday, you're not double checking with Newton uh, police reports or any of that phoning up the post office or anything in that thing, you're not double checking to find out if the news, the uh, post office really was robbed on a Thursday. We all know that newspapers frequently make mistakes. They'll say uh, a victim of a crime was 36 years old and it turns out actually they were 40 years old. But the journalist has made a mistake. That happens all of the time. What you're not doing is double checking the accuracy of the reporting because your main interest here is in how news impacts the reader and the reader can only go on what they've read because the reader is no more able to double check facts than you are as the researcher so even where the facts facts even where the data reported in the newspaper is inaccurate Nonetheless, it will probably be believed by the average newspaper reader. And so you're starting to think about the impact on the average newspaper reader, not upon how accurate, how valid the offences are that are reported in the newspapers. That said, you can't actually make direct statements or predictions about how this will definitely impact newspaper readers because you've not sat a bunch of people down in a room, showed them the newspapers and then asked how they felt afterwards. So you are generalizing, you're theorizing, you're looking at people who have conducted research in the past, so well, 
as per things we've mentioned in previous classes, if you read about a lot of crimes in your neighbourhood, it will tend to make you nervous because you'll expect the, the possibility that you yourself might fall victim to one of those crimes. We know other researchers have said that in the past, and we can certainly mention those those research projects that have been done in the past, obviously flagging up that, that some of those were done in other countries, some of them were done in other decades. Do those theories that they came up with in other countries and other decades still apply to Britain in this decade? Well, that's where you can start to speculate. But essentially, your, your number crunching the reporting of crime and thinking about it in very broad terms, rather than thinking about how specific people react to specific newspapers because you're not sitting them down to find out how they react to those newspapers. Now, charts and graphs. These are just two random charts I nicked off the internet to illustrate the point. You can use things like pie charts and bar graphs. They're quite straightforward to create. I'll show you in a second how to create them. Um, to illustrate the sorts of crimes you are particularly interested in. Now, some of them can be general. So, for example, the pie chart could show relationships, uh, fractions, percentages of all manner of crimes that you have studied. And it's a way of summarizing um, your schedule that you've created showing all manner of crimes. Whereas you could use something like the uh, bar graph to compare for a, a, a demographic crimes committed by men or crimes committed by women or crimes committed against black people or crimes committed against white people or, or whatever particular demographic it is that you want to look at you could use the the charts to, different charts to illustrate different things when you put your charts into your findings section make sure you label them so state what the chart is um, and if it's something like a bar chart, make sure it indicates, as with this one, types of crime along the bottom. And up the side, there should also be a, a statement number of crimes going up the side. So it's clear cut what the chart is about. Um, that'll get you an extra brownie point. And if you can offer an explanation, which could be just a paragraph, it doesn't have to be huge amounts of waffle. Just a paragraph is fine saying this chart demonstrates the um, percentages of men and women engaging in shoplifting in um, as reported in local newspapers for argument's sake and so there, there we have a, an explanation of what it's about so i as the reader and the second reader and the external examiner will get a clear-cut sense of what you're not just shoving in random graphs for the sake of shoving in random graphs you are putting in graphs that you understand you understand them because you've explained them. So that's how we know you understand them. So it's not just, oh, look, here's a graph. Don't know what it's about, but here's a graph. We, we get a clear sense that you, the writer, understand what these graphs represent. That's where you get the extra points. So these are coding schedules at the top and coding manual at the bottom. Now, the coding schedule, these are quite short. I've kept this very, very short. The real thing would be longer than this. They explain the coding schedule at the top. So the first column is the day. Second column, which newspapers are being reported on. Third column, which crimes you're reporting about. Then on to the gender of the victim, the age of the victim, the gender of the criminal, the age of the criminal. Now, what I would suggest is whatever demographic data you, sh you show about the victim, you also show the same demographic data about the criminals or at least suspects, if not always necessarily convicted criminals. So if you mention um, the religion of one, you should mention the religion of the other. If you mention the race of one, you should mention the race of the other, etc. There are other factors you could add onto this, but we'll, we'll stick to this for the moment. Now, how do we understand this? So let's go to the top line of the, the coding schedule. And the numbers read across 1, 1A, 2, 1, 1, 1, 5. Now we look down at the coding manual at the bottom of the screen and in the column for day it tells me that the number one is Monday that 1a is the sun that the number two is arson the number one female um, and age if number one is under 18 
So I'd know from looking at that column and, and comparing it to your manual that on Monday the Sun newspaper mentioned an arson in which there was a woman in the house. I don't know if she was burned to death or she escaped at this stage, but she was in the house. Uh, a, a woman or a girl, if you prefer, under the age of 18. And that the person who carried out the arson, the one who set the fire, was also a woman, but in an age bracket older than 45, because um, I didn't extend the column down long enough to show what the number five would signify. But it would be over, let's say, 45 to 56 would be age bracket number five. Whereas if I look at row number, this, the second row along in um, the coding schedule at the top there, the number two, that's a Tuesday, 1B, the mirror. Crime number five, well, that's not listed here, so let's pretend crime number five is, um, oh, what could it be? Hit and run accident, a hit and run accident. And the gender two, male, so a man was run over in a hit and run accident, don't know if he died, don't know if he survived. Um, the age of the victim three, well, that man was between the ages of 26 to 35 on the age column. And who did the running over? Who was driving the car at the time? Well, that was another, uh, um, that was another man driving the car. And the age of the man driving the car in number four would have been between 36 and 45. So that way I can understand. So you have your coding schedule, which could be quite long because it's detailing all of the crimes you've looked at in a whole week's worth of newspapers. And your coding manual would contain as much information as it needs to contain to explain the code numbers for the days of the week, the code numbers for the newspapers you've used, code numbers for the crimes you've detailed, and so on and so on and so on. Um, we should also add here the reason that it's you've got in the newspaper coding manual 1A, 1B, 2A, 2B is that the number one is for national newspapers and the number two here for local newspapers. You could do it the other way around. It doesn't matter, matter which way around you do that one. But just the suggestion you have one number for local and one number for national. Okay, so far hopefully so good. And these manuals you can create just by clicking on the, the grid function in um, Word and that will create you one of these uh, grids to, to fill in as you go along quite straightforward. If you're not sure where to find that on Word, let me know and I'll explain to you. There are potential other factors you might want to think about. For example, you, you don't have to think about these. This is just optional if you want to bring this in. So on your um, coding schedule, you could have a couple of extra columns there. And these couple of extra columns could include issues to do with journalism. And those issues to do with journalism could be, for example, was there a photograph included? So you would have perhaps the number one, yes, there was a photograph. Number two, no, no photograph. You could also have number of columns. So as you can see from that inset photograph um, in that article about no appeal against five year sentence, we've got one, two, three, four columns there. So you, you, the number you'd put on your chart would be how many columns does the article take up? And obviously the implication is there that the higher the number, the, the bigger the space on the page, therefore the more prominence the crime has. Where if it's only one column, you know, that's, that's a minor issue that they are a bit of a filler kind of a thing, rather than a major focus on the crime. So you, you could have those as well. Um, you might potentially want to consider the page number in the newspaper. So does it appear front page major headline or is it some piddly little thing right on page 25 right at the back of the newspaper where it probably hardly noticed at all. So what prominence is given and simply the coding number you'd use would be the number of the page in the newspaper. Um, that's a way of reflecting not so much on the crime itself, but on how the newspaper journalists and the editors feature a crime. So normally if they put a photo in, it's giving it more prominence because people's eye, reader's eyes are drawn to photographs. The more column space it takes up, the more people will pay attention to it. And the closer it is to the front page, 
the more people will pay attention to it. That's an option to consider. Now, in terms of creating your bar charts, and what you could do at this stage is to pause this video and have a crack at doing this, and then come back to listen to it after you've had a crack at doing it. Now, some of you, I'm sure, will know exactly how to create a bar chart anyway. This won't be news to you, but some of you might not have created a bar chart before in Word. You'll be relieved to know your idea so that you don't have to do this in Atlas. You can do it in Word, it's a damn sight quicker. So what you do, go along on your menu bar at the top and look for that icon with the three colored bars chart. Now, different versions of Word, different editions of Word will not necessarily have the icon appearing in the set icons in the same order that you can see in this little box on the screen, this image here. So you just have to look through your own version of Word and find that icon for chart. So you click on that and you get the drop down box giving you various options now just for a practice one what i suggest you do is choose the first box on that lower image here on this screen um, which is the one the first one in the top left hand corner it's called clustered column now it doesn't actually matter which one of these you use for your report this is just me suggesting you do this for practice practice get used to it and then choose whichever graphic you like to go in your actual report itself. Now when you've clicked on that clustered column uh, little box there a page in Excel will appear and you enter the data into the page in Excel as you enter it into Excel the, um, the graph the bar chart on Word changes by itself as if by magic the little elves make it change. So what will appear is your Excel page. This is a tiny section from an Excel page on the screen here. The real thing is much bigger. So in our boxes on column A, enter the types of crime. So the ones I put here are murder, robbery, shoplifting, drunk and disorderly. You could put anything you like on there. Um, in line one of columns A, B and C, I've put at the top there, you can see men, women, unknown. Unknown simply meaning that the newspaper doesn't tell you if it's a man or a woman. Or it might give you a name, but maybe it's not obvious from the name, especially perhaps if it's a, a, a foreign name you're unfamiliar with and you're not too sure if that's a man's name or a woman's name, or one of those ambiguous names like Leslie that could be a man or a woman. So you put unknown. And then in line two, what would you start to enter your numbers, your raw data? Now, obviously, you can see on the screen here I've got 584, 713. 2, 14, 6, 22, 7, 11. You can put in any numbers you fancy because you're just doing this as a practice piece to see how it comes out rather than as a, uh, your actual data. Once you're used to the actual date to, to the practice piece, then do it properly with your actual data. As soon as you put in as many numbers as you're happy with, you close the Excel page and voila! The magic elves will have made your chart appear in Word with the various um, names and numbers and, and what have you on them. And then you can, once you've done the real thing with your real data, cut and paste that into your actual report, into your write-up. And then think about what you might say. So would you, how would you describe your made-up imaginary data? So will this indicate so-and-so types of crimes and so-and-so types of newspapers? as and um, showing ratios of men and women and so forth and you'd explain it that way so if you want to pause for a bit have a crack at doing this and then when you're happy that you're confident at creating bar charts come back to this recording that's an example hopefully if you follow the same numbers i used you'll see something like this and it will show you there the, the color block for men, the color block for women, the color block for unknown. If you don't like the colors on the screen, you can click on each bar individually and it will change the colors to whatever you'd prefer it. So you can create different colors and different patterns and so on um, to make it nice and legible and easy to follow. Now for the next piece, we're going to create a pie chart. I say we, you are going to create a pie chart. So again, open Word and go on to that same chart net icon that showed you on the previous screen. And this time you scroll down a little bit further to where it says under all charts, going down a little bit, it says pie. 
So you click on that one and it will give you a series of different styles of pie chart, um, three dimensional ones and flat ones and all sorts of ones. Um, so if you click on the, the standard first one that appears there, which is the one you can see on the screen in the inset image, uh, that's, that's the basic pie chart image. And once again, Excel will open up and you start to enter your data into Excel. Um, so for this particular one, just as a suggestion, I mean, you might want to do something different, but as a suggestion, in column A, into the types of crime. So there you, on this inset bit, you've got theft, speeding, kidnap, murder, arson, burglary, or whatever ones you want. Um, in line one of where it says columns, give it the name of the pie chart, local newspaper crimes. And this is the labeling thing you were talking about earlier. This is what will appear as a label on your um, chart when you finally cut and paste it and put it into your report. So you might want to go for local newspaper crimes or you might want to do national, entirely up to you. Now line two onwards, you start to enter the raw data for how many crimes, so the numbers there, 20, 43, 2, 8, 5, 18, so forth. Um, so you enter them in. And when you've finished doing that on um, Excel, you close Excel down and the magic pixies transfer it into this. And again, you can, if you don't like the color schemes, you can click on it and change the color schemes. There's also a button you can click on the chart, which will cause the actual numbers to appear on the graph itself. So when you cut and paste it, it will have the numbers already on it and it'll be nice and easy to read. But you can fact, you just play around with that and find the buttons. It's all quite straightforward. And again, think how you would describe it. So it's already got the, the title, local newspaper crimes, it's already labeled. But how would you explain this? So you could say, for example, on this one, clearly speeding makes up by far the larger majority of crimes reported in local newspapers, followed by theft, which is quite a hefty chunk, then burglaries so of property crimes of various different sorts. Um, the, the least incident reported here, kidnap, not surprising that doesn't happen very often, not a popular crime to commit. Um, so you, you focus on, and in this case, there's no murders taking place that week to report, or at least if anyone's been murdered, the police didn't know about it, didn't make it into the newspapers yet. Maybe no one has found the body, who knows. But you'd start to explain that in a little bit more detail as you go along. Okay. Now, just to double check, um, I know most of you have done this already, but just to double check, have you all conducted an interview or have you got somebody lined up to interview? So even if you haven't actually done it yet, you've at least know there is so-and-so person that you can interview. If you haven't done it yet, I, I have to emphasize, do your interview at a distance by telephone or by email or whatever other type of distance means you use, because obviously with all the quarantining business, unless the person we're interviewing actually lives in the same house as you're already anyway, then it's best not to um, meet up. I suppose you could sit on opposite park benches and shout at each other across the way and frighten the pigeons if you really want to, but just keep your distance from the person you are interviewing. Um, once you've got your, your interview data from them, store it. Now I should say at this stage, it is possible that the hand-in date for your second assignment might change depending on what happens with the, the national situation and the guidelines we received from college. If that happens and it gets postponed, put back a, a week or whatever, then I will obviously let you know. But for the moment, just assume the same date you've already got and work to that until you hear anything different. Um, the bit about booking a college room, well, that would only apply if we were still able to meet at the college. If they find a miracle cure for coronavirus tomorrow, that might become possible, but you know, being realistic, the chances are you will have to do your interview by email or, or some other telephone means, whatever, and do it that way rather than meet face to face with the person. We'll work on that. Now, the this, this second um, podcast, which I will be doing in a bit, once I've had a cup of tea and a sandwich, because, you know, working from home, I can do things like that now. Well, hey. <laughs> we'll look a little bit more at content analysis and start picking up on theories 
of religion and theories of advertising for those of you whose second assignment is either looking at the religion question or at the advertising question. For those of you who are looking at the dieting question, we'll be doing that the week after. So we will get to that. Um, I've not wholly made up my mind about the in-class quiz. Um, you can do that online, but I, I think I might put the date back for that so you've got a bit more time because there's other things you need to be focusing on. And I do appreciate you, that many of you will have kids or elderly relatives that you're looking after. And, and so faffing around with quizzes is perhaps the least thing you need to be thinking about at this juncture. But anyway, I'll, I'll let you know in the, the second podcast what I decide on that. So I'll just finish with this one for now, upload it. You can listen to it at your leisure. Um, the policy we're taking with the registers, or the policy I'm taking with the registers, is that as long as you try and watch this within the course of the next week, thus the uh, Brightspace will show me um, the names of the people who've watched the recording, and that will effectively mean you were present in class, and so I will tick that off to say that you have been there, and I feel that there won't be any problems with registers and absentees and that sort of thing. That's how we we'll work that one. So, hopefully that explains everything. Any questions, as I said, email or Facebook, um, potentially we can do Skype phone calls, but they are a bit time consuming. So other means if you can. Okay, thank you.